just a couple of quick announcements because we have a, a full service today. Uh, there's a sheet going around with the request for desserts from the Hartford Fire Department. Um, they're asking for desserts for their chili and soup supper that's uh, this coming Saturday. So if you're willing to donate to that, just sign up on that sheet. Uh, the faith program is going to resume here in January, but this Wednesday we're going to be having a parent meeting um, to discuss some things with the parents for the spring term. And so we will have announcements hopefully very soon on official start dates and end dates and all those fun things. But um, if you would like to help volunteer, just let Ann know or call the church office and we will get you signed up. There's a few activities around town. It's a busy weekend. Got bingo night and then the fireman's supper. So it, there will be lots to do. Um, and of course, the weather looks dodgy on and off all week. And next weekend looks brutally cold. So um, yeah, bundle up, get warm, get ready because winter finally decided to arrive. So um, let's see. Any, uh, Anne, you had an announcement. I hope that many of you received the email this week about a special project that we're doing for Mr. Emery. And you'll notice there's a little basket back there for contributions. Um, the whole story was in the email that was sent, but basically we're trying to help um, support Emery get transported from daycare to preschool each day. If they were living in this area, they probably we'd probably be doing it personally. But this is one way we can do it so that we can help um, Anita and Emery get, get that all taken care of. Um, I had a message from Anita this morning because she was planning to be here, she and Emery were. And I think it might have been a respite weekend for Michael and they got called to go pick Michael up because he had a swollen red eye. So they didn't get to make it, but I think you'll get to see them in weeks ahead. But anyway, any gift that you want to give to them, just put in the basket, and we will make sure that the family gets it, and um, we'll be able to help support Emory. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I'm going to, since I've got this microphone, I just want to remind everyone that congregational reports are due on Ju January 15th. That's a week from tomorrow, and um, <clears throat> in preparation for our congregational meeting, and you'll hear more about that. That's on February 4th. So I think that's all I have. Okay. All right. So uh, we do have an anniversary in the house. Yay, Teresa. So we're going to sing. So let's do that next. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary. That's all the announcements. Um, be sure to pay attention to the mission ministries because, of course, the suggested food items have changed for January, and uh, per capita this year will be $50 per person. I'm going to apologize right now for anything that's wrong in the bulletin or on the slides because this week I did them, and it's been a lot of years since I've done that. So um, I already caught, like, one typo, and I went, oh, well, <clears throat> after we'd printed them. So... I'm just apologizing up front. So um, Gloria at least is back home and, and on the mend, so hopefully she will be able to be back with us soon. All right. Well, then let's begin. Uh, we'll begin today with our in memoriam. This morning we are honoring the memory of Sylvester Butch Lemley who was born on January 8, 1942. Butch attended Community United Presbyterian Church and felt at home with the church family here. He passed away on February 10, 2023. We remember his life with a single red carnation as a symbol of love, knowing that love never ends. As Butch's church family, we take time to extend our love to those closest to him including his wife, Linda, his children, Scott and Elaine Lemley, Jolene, Rich, and 
and Rich Young, Pamela F.L., Peggy and Mike West, stepchildren Mike and Tammy Lynch, Melissa and Steve Hagstrom, and Steve and Vicki Lynch, and their families, which include 16 grandchildren, 14 grand, great-grandchildren, as well as sisters Clara Edna Sammons and Esther Rogers. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Please stand as you are willing for the call to worship. From God comes my salvation. God alone is my rock and my salvation. God is my fortress. I shall never be shaken. Our opening hymn is Will You Come and Follow Me? Let's sing.
prophet appeared in the wilderness, calling the people to repent, be baptized, and prepare the way of the Lord. We return to the water to confess our sins, giving thanks for the grace of Jesus Christ, the one who has come to save us. Let us pray. God of all glory, you look from heaven and see us as we are, not worthy to kneel at your feet, not ready to welcome your way. Forgive us, gracious God. In Christ, stoop down to save us. Loose the ties that bind us to sin and set us free to love and serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear the good news of the gospel. As a voice from heaven said to Jesus, so says God to each of us. You are my beloved child, and with you I am well pleased. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So I have with me here um, this book that's called Mark as Story. And what it does is it's written by a couple of scholars, but one of the things they do to the Gospel of Mark is they put it in one continuous narrative. They take out the chapter headings and the verse numbers and 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 They've gone back, and rather than polish up the language, they've left it, which most translations do. They polish it up for you. They've left it so that you really start to hear how, you know, the repetitive parts of some of this. So if you want to follow along, you can. Um, but I'm going to read chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the anointed one, the Son of God, just as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will pave your way. The cry of one shouting in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. It was John baptizing in the desert and proclaiming a baptism of turning around for pardon of sins. And the whole Judean countryside and all the Jerusalemites were going out to him and being baptized by him in the Jordan River, publicly admitting their sins. And John was wearing camel's hair with a leather band around his waist, and he was eating grasshoppers and wild honey. And he was proclaiming, saying, After me is coming one stronger than I am, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And it happened. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. And coming up from the water, immediately he saw the heavens being ripped open and the spirit like a dove coming down onto him. And there was a voice from the heavens, you are my beloved son, I delighted choosing you. And immediately the spirit drove him out into the desert and he was in the desert 40 days tested by Satan. And he was among the wild animals and the angels were serving him. Now, after John was handed over to prison, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the good news about God and saying, the right time is fulfilled and the rule of God has arrived. Turn around and put faith in the good news. And going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting nets in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, come after me and I'll make you become fishers for people. And immediately leaving the nets, they followed him. And going ahead a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat preparing the nets. And immediately he called them. And leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired workers, they went off after him. Let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Okay. 
got visuals today. All right. I haven't done this in a while, so I'm going to try my hand. It's a new year, new resolution. So we're going to be in Mark's Gospel for a while. And I wanted us today to, since we're reading the very beginning, the very opening 20 verses, let's talk a little bit about Mark and what we're going to see. One of the things you'll notice in Mark is unusual urgency, as they like to say. The word and, 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 and then immediately, immediately, immediately. I think it's 11 times in the first chapter the word immediately happens. It's go, 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 go. Next thing, next thing, next thing. There's no extra. There's no fluff. Let's move. We got things to do. Okay. The other thing you'll see in Mark is an emphasis of Jesus' deeds over words. Um, there's not a lot of teaching, per se. There's some, especially with his disciples, but there's not like a Sermon on the Mount. There's not huge swaths of teaching. There's much more healing. Um, there's, there's much more deeds and actions and confrontation than there is words and teaching. Dominated by a long passion narrative. Um, the Gospel of Mark is 15 chapters and a few extra verses. And the start of chapter 11 is Palm Sunday. So the first 10 chapters are the entire ministry of Jesus. And then the last five chapters are the last week. So it's a huge passion narrative with some introduction. The language and style of Mark are a lot less refined. It's this quick, let's go, let's go, let's go. Um, in the original, it's just, there's not, it's not fun, high-level grammar. Luke is much more poised in his grammar and in his language choice than Mark is. It's very focused in Galilee. We are not in Jerusalem at all, other than coming down to the Jordan to get baptized, then he leaves, and coming down at the very end. The rest of it is all up in Galilee, back and forth across the, the Sea of Galilee, all up in the north. None of this happens around Jerusalem. Mark's written for Gentile audience. There's places in here where he goes into great detail describing Jewish customs and practices, simple things, like the way they wash things and the, way, the reason they do things the way they do. He wouldn't do that if he had a Jewish audience. So obviously, this is written more for a Gentile audience. Mark's portrait of Jesus is the most human. And I'll get into that a little more later. But there's much more emotion. You see much more of, of a human being. He doesn't always know everything. He doesn't always get it right the first time. There's a lot more emotion at the surface. Anybody who's read through this at any length, as some of us at Bible study the other day commented, the secrecy motif. He'll do something and say, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell them who I am. Don't tell them what you saw. People never listen. But he tells them repeatedly, don't say anything. They kept secrets about as well as we do. The failures of Jesus' disciples. This is a big one. Because they are horrible in this gospel. They don't get it. They never get it. They refuse to get it. They, they're, they're always just wandering around doing the wrong thing and saying awful. I mean, it, through the entire thing, they can't get it right. So when we talk about a gospel, like Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, we have to remember these are not biographies or historical chronicles the way we think of them in the modern world. They're not going to lay out every moment of someone's life. It's not like reading David McCullough, who's going to give you everything. Or um, was it Chernow, who wrote the one about Hamilton? You know, it's not that kind of book. This is also not a martyrdom narrative. That was a whole genre of things that would tell these awful stories about the Christian martyrs. It's not that either. It's its own unique item. Basically, it's defined as a passion narrative with an extended introduction, like I said. It's a story about Jesus that focuses on his death and his resurrection. That's what a gospel is, because it's the death and resurrection that's the good news, because that did something really important. 
That's what's being lifted up. So that's what we have to think about. Now, when it comes to Mark, folks are often disappointed because of the things that are not in Mark. Like I said, no nativity story, no Sermon on the Mount, no long conversations with people like in John, like when he has that long discourse with Nicodemus or with the woman at the well. And there's almost no parables. There's a few, but not many. Uh, no resurrection appearances. So most people look at Mark almost as defective. It's like, what is wrong with this? It's not, they just, you don't need to read it. Just don't read it. Just read Matthew. It's all in there anyway. That's what people will tell you. But it's got its own message and its own point that's really important. Jesus is a great moral teacher. I mean, the stuff that's said in Matthew, the things that are said in Luke are important. But that's not why he's central to our faith. The prophets were great moral teachers, but we didn't base a religion around them. Jesus is central to our faith for very different reasons. It's that crucifixion salvation stuff at the end, not because of what he taught. Mark is also not an ethical handbook. None of the Gospels are. It's supposed to be the good news about Jesus Christ. It's supposed to be the good news about God. Mark's main purpose isn't telling us how to live. It's how to worship. And that's a very different thing. Mark has a very distinct purpose. He wants us to worship God through Christ. And he's showing us who Christ is so we can do that. Now, Jesus is important because he's the window through which we see God, which I thought was a great metaphor when I saw that because when I was thinking about all the pictures of Jesus on the windows. Um, but he's the window through which we see God most clearly. You know, through his life, his death, his resurrection, that's where God's love becomes visible in ways we can't see in any other fashion. That's important. And what I said before about the speed, in just the first 20 verses of chapter 1, we have a prologue, we have John the Baptist's ministry, we have Jesus getting baptized, we have Jesus being forced out for testing in the wilderness, which I love because it's like a verse and a half, two sentences. And immediately the Spirit drove him out into the desert, he was in the desert 40 days tested by Satan, and he was among the wild animals, and the angels were serving him. Done. There's no conversations with Satan. There's no standing on the top of the temple and looking. No, no. Nope. He was in the desert. He was tested. The angels served him. We're out. We also have Jesus' public appearance in Galilee at the start of his ministry. And then we have the call of the first disciples, of Simon and Andrew and James and John. All of that in 20 verses. It took Luke two chapters to get Jesus born. Mark's already blown through everything. We've already called disciples, and we're only 20 verses in. This is going to move and move quickly. And when you, I, I encourage all of you, sit down and read the first 10 chapters sometime. You can do it in under an hour. Just sit down and read it straight through. Don't stop. Just read it straight through. And it's like you're out of breath because the whole ministry, it's like it happened in a couple of weeks. It just moves through everything. It's a very different feel because most of the time we've chopped it up and moved it around and it's not in the right order. And, and we don't just read it like the story, the narrative it was, how the first people heard it. Most people couldn't read. So they heard somebody sit down and read it to them. So listen for it. So let's look at a couple of these verses up close. So verses 2 and 3, that first verse is just the, the intro. This is the, you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So verses 2 and 3, as it's written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, 
Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So here's the dirty secret. That's not just from Isaiah. It's a compilation of Exodus 23, Isaiah 40, and Malachi 3. There's a little bit of all three of those in that one little sentence. So what's important about those three things? Well, 2nd Isaiah is all about words of comfort. I mean, that's the part that begins, comfort, comfort my people, okay? This is, we're speaking comfort to these people who've been in exile. It's it's all full of these themes of, you know, and Mark picks up on them too. Forgiveness of sin and, you know, clearing the path in the wilderness and tearing open the heavens for the spirit. That's going to be a big one. The nearness of God's rule, the extension of good news to all the nations. Those are all themes in 2 Isaiah, and they're all themes that Mark is going to use. And so it's, it's important that he used this at the very beginning. Now Malachi is about judgment. Old Testament ends with Malachi. So Mark is, in a sense, starting up where, you know, the old prophecies ended 450 years earlier. So when Malachi wrote, Jerusalem's wondering why God isn't acting on their behalf. Why is, is, is God not here? They're getting impatient. They've been waiting and waiting and waiting, and they're still waiting. And Malachi warns them, the messenger's coming. Oh, the messenger's coming. But you're not going to delight in this. Who can endure the day of the coming of the Lord? You're not going to like this when the messenger comes. Are you, are you sure this is what you want? So then we get to Exodus. Eric, he's zoned out on me. You've been so good, and you zoned out. Sir. So then we get to Exodus. God's going to send an angel or a messenger, and if the people obey him, then God will be an enemy to their enemies. God will be on their side. But if they rebel against this messenger, then God will not pardon their transgressions. Okay, that's what these three passages have been about. So what's Mark trying to tell us? What is the combination of things he's trying to put together? And they add up to the old adage. Be careful what you wish for. God's about to do a great thing. That is good news. But it's not the good news people are expecting. And it's not the good news they're going to be really comfortable with. This is going to come at a cost. This is going to come in ways you don't expect and you don't want. So be careful what you wish for. Because you may not get what you're expecting. So let's look then at Jesus' baptism, because I think this is a great example of what we're talking about. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased." Now, the verb in there that describes what's happening to the heavens, it's not, it's a very forceful word. It's, it's, it's not, it does mean ripped apart or torn open. Now, both Matthew and Luke use the same story, but they really tone it down and just say the heavens were opened. They don't, it's a different verb. And the scholar, Donald Jewell, notes that, you know, what's opened may be closed. What is torn apart cannot easily return to its former state. There's always a mark there. Even if you sew it together really well, there's always a mark. Or if it's, you know, think of you know, whatever. If, it, if it's a book, there's going to be tape or some sort of join to put this back together. So in Mark's version, in this moment, heaven and earth have been forever changed because they've been ripped open. And I put on here, there is a dove, I put no, there is a dove descending, but it doesn't say peacefully. That was the part I was trying to get at. It just says that the dove descends, but there's nothing peaceful about it where that word gets added in later. There's no crowd witnessing all of this. 
No one else hears the voice of God, just Jesus, which isn't true in some of the other versions. And then Jesus is immediately driven into the wilderness to be tested. It's another one of those where it says, and then he went, you know, and the heavens opened and God, you know, heavens torn open and God said, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. It says, and immediately Jesus was driven into the wilderness. As soon as it's over. No, no party afterwards. My family, after baptism, there's usually some sort of luncheon and cake or something. Nope, none of that. Get in the wilderness. Off you go. It's time to go. And that moment of the baptism is important for two reasons. The heavens get ripped open and God speaks. Both of those things happen again in Mark in different places. The next time God speaks, it's on the mountain at the transfiguration. And he calls Jesus his beloved son. And this time the disciples hear it too because they're told, listen to him. The next time we see the very same verb that I talked about, about being ripped open, is at the end of the gospel. When Jesus dies and the curtain in the temple is torn in two, it's the same verb. So that whole idea of being literally ripped apart is what happens. This is not nice and pretty and calm. It's very earthy and very in your face what's going on. I mean, Mark, we have to remember, I mean, he is a really good storyteller. He really is. And he's very good at linking together bits all the way through the entire narrative. I mean, the same verb is used when the Spirit drives Jesus into the wilderness. Because that's how it's said. Jesus is driven into the wilderness. It's the same exact verb that gets used when he's driving evil spirits out of other people. So he's just as driven as they are. Now, we know discomfort's extreme when we look at the calling of the first disciples. That's always a hard passage for folks. Because being a disciple of Jesus means, you know, you receive the call. You have to physically follow him. You don't get to just, you know, do it mentally. Um, In this case, they're giving up jobs, homes, normal family life. And these, we want to think of Jesus' disciples as being poor and having nothing. These are businessmen. They have thriving businesses. Simon's got his own house, has multiple generations living with him, you know, Zebedee and his sons, James and John, they have hired men working for them to help them fish. These are not the lowest of the low. They gave up something for this. Giving up, you know, family life, risking the suffering that's to come. They gave up a lot. There's no discussion, no explanation, no goodbyes. Jesus calls, they obey. So by paring away all the extra stuff, what Mark has done is all the emphasis is on Jesus' command. Follow me. That's why we sang that hymn this morning. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you? Bonhoeffer, I love Bonhoeffer. One of the things he talked about is that Faith doesn't precede obedience. Now, we often think if we had deeper faith, then we'd go out and we'd serve the gospel and we'd feed people and we'd do all the things that we see other people do that we're so envious of. But what Bonhoeffer is saying is that we shouldn't try to cultivate our faith so that someday we'll get there. Rather, if we just go ahead and obey, we'll find our faith growing. Kind of like fake it till you make it. You know, get in there and do it, and you'll find that your faith grows. You'll learn things about yourself you didn't know. You'll learn things about other people you didn't know. You'll discover what it is some of those gifts are that you have, that you didn't even know you had. All of us are summoned to serve. We all are. I mean, the other title of that song, Will You Come and Follow Me, is The Summons. That's what it's called. The only other time we hear that word is like jury duty. 
isn't it? Jury summons. That's it. So only jury, only the court and God can summon you, I guess. But there's a sense that we're, you know, we choose to follow Jesus voluntarily. But what we have to recognize is that in our choosing, we've been chosen. And in our seeking, we've already been sought. Discipleship has a cost. That's one of Mark's first messages to us. That's the one we all need to take to heart. Discipleship has a cost. It had a cost to the first disciples. It has a cost to us. And that makes Mark's message even more difficult because he doesn't pat it and make it nice and soft and wonderful for us. It's harsh and in your face. And yes, there's a cost to being a disciple. And you need to be willing to pay it because you've already been called and already been sought. You're already there. What you need to do is understand it and take it to heart and do it which is what we all need to do. And so in the weeks ahead, as we, as we go through Mark, we're going to really dig in to a lot of these places where Mark has some really hard things to say. The other gospel writers who used his stuff and came later softened the edges a lot. And Mark doesn't do that. He pulls no punches. And so when we go through Mark, there's going to be some hard things. And there's some passages I really don't want to preach on, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because it's important for all of you and for me that we do that. So remember, discipleship has a cost. It all has a cost. And let's all take that to heart. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this chance to be together in worship. At the start of this new year, help us to see with new eyes, experience you with an open heart, listen for things we haven't heard before. Show us the the way that you have opened. We know that you've summoned us. Help us to follow, to obey to do what you have led us to do. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so let's sing our next song, Lord, You Have Come to the Lakeshore.
invite Larissa and Barb to come up. Larry has agreed to serve longer on session, but we haven't actually voted him in yet. So we're going to have to do that at the congregational meeting. And then we'll install you all on your own, Larry, I promise. <laughs> all right. Since we don't have to do an ordination, this one should be a little bit shorter. There are varieties of gifts, but it is the same spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given a gift of the spirit to be used for the common good. Together, we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We are all called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling, to be disciples of Jesus Christ and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service, as deacons, as ruling elders, and as ministers of word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us. Through ordination, God provides for acts of care and compassion in the world, for the ordering and governance of the church, and for the preaching of the word and celebration of the sacraments. The session of CUPC installs to active service those who have been previously ordained, ruling elders Barb Menser and Larissa Curry. As God calls some to particular forms of ministry, God calls us all to bear gladly the yoke of Christ given in the covenant of baptism. Let us therefore reaffirm our baptismal vows, renouncing all that opposes God and God's rule and affirming the faith of the church. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? And this is for all of you. If so, say, I do. I do. do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? If so, say, I do. I do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, say, I will. Let us confess the faith of our baptism, as we say. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Larissa and Barb, in baptism you were claimed by the love of God, clothed in the grace of Jesus Christ and anointed with the gifts of the Spirit to share Christ's mission in the world. Now you are called by God through the voice of the church for new service and ministry in Jesus' name. In accordance with the Constitution of the Presbyterian Church USA, show your commitment to this calling by responding to these questions. Do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? If so, say, I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, say, I do and I will. Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? If so, say, I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry working with them subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, say, I will. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, say, I will. 
Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? If so, say, I do. Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? If so, say, I will. Will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in councils of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will. And do you, the members of the church, accept Larissa and Barb as ruling elders, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? If so, say, we do. Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? If so, say, we do. Very good. All right. Now, normally, when we have the prayer for ordination, it involves the laying on of hands and all of that, and we don't necessarily have to do that with an installation. However, I know that's one of everybody's favorite things to do. So, not to deny anyone the fun, we will come and stand here in the middle, and if anybody wants, who's been an elder wants to come up and join, please do so. You are welcome to do that. And come on up and join us in prayer. It's one of those moments where everybody goes, you mean we're not going to do it? <laughs> yes, we'll do it. We will do it. <laughs> no headlocks or half Nelsons or... <laughs> Uh, that's true, she did. She did. All right. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you thanks and praise. Throughout the ages and in every place, you have chosen servants from among your people to point the way to salvation by your grace. We are grateful for ancestors in the faith who followed without fear, placing their trust in you alone for judges and monarchs who ruled in righteousness and peace, for prophets and apostles who spoke your bold words of mercy and of truth, for leaders and teachers in every age who have nurtured your people in faith and faithfulness. Above all, we praise you for Jesus Christ who came not to be served but to serve and to give his life to set others free. Anointed by your Holy Spirit, he proclaimed your reign on earth, revealing your saving love in all he said and did. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your servants, Larissa and Barb, as they continue in the ministry to which you have called them. Help them to re rely on the gifts of your spirit and to follow Christ faithfully in this calling. By the gifts of your Holy Spirit, empower them to build up the church, to strengthen the common life of your people, and to lead with compassion and vision. In the walk of faith and for the work of ministry, give to all your servants gladness and strength, discipline and hope, humility, humor, and courage, and an abiding sense of your presence. Pour out your spirit of power and truth upon the whole church, but that we may be for you a holy people, baptized to serve you in the world. Sustain your church and ministry, ground us in the gospel, secure our hope in Christ, strengthen our service to the outcast, and increase our love for one another. Show us the transforming power of your grace in our life together that we may be effective servants of the gospel, offering a compelling witness in the world to the good news of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So, Larissa and Barb, you are now ruling elders again. <laughs> Yay! Yay. Congrats, and we're going to start another year. So we will continue our service as we receive our tithes and our morning offerings.
go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose in your being there. Christ lives in you and has something he wants to do through you wherever you are. Believe this and go in the grace and the love and the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.